Φίλε και φίλοι, χαίρετε. Είμαι ο Ραφαήλ Καλυβιώτη. Καλώ ήρθατε σε άλλη μια εκπομπή Right to the Bone. Shut up and sit down. You wanted law and order in this town. You've got it. People are ready to tell us this is not possible. That is not possible. I say whatever the true interest of our country calls for is always possible. He had a press conference the other day that he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic party of the community. He wanted the commission to be the executive and he wanted the council of ministers to be the senate. No, no, no. You know, they have a word. It sort of became old-fashioned. It's called a nationalist. And I say, really, we're not supposed to use that word. You know what I am? I'm a nationalist, okay? I'm a nationalist. You know, when I came here 17 years ago, and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? You wanted law and order in this town. You've got it. Φίλες και φίλοι, καλησπέρα. Σήμερα είναι μια ιδιαίτερη περίπτωση. Ε, σήμερα θα έχουμε μαζί μας τον Chief Operation Officer ε, του Turning Point UK, τον Nick Tenconi, ο οποίος ε, είναι στο Turning Point UK, το οποίο είναι μια οργάνωση διεθνής, ξεκίνησε από την Αμερική, επικεφαλής και όσο το γνωρίζουν είναι ο Charlie Kirk στο Turning Point USA. Είναι μια οργάνωση η οποία έχει ως σκοπό, ως στόχο να αντιπαλεύσει με αντεπιχειρήματα την πολιτική ορθότητα, την ιδεολογική ηγεμονία αλλά και την πρακτική της αριστεράς. Το ενδιαφέρον έχει, είναι ότι έχει ακτιβιστικά στοιχεία. Είναι πάρα πολύ ωραίο κατά τη δική μας εκτίμηση ότι θα έχουμε διεθνείς καλεσμένους που έχουν κύρος και οι οποίοι ανήκουν στο εν γέννη συντηρητικό κίνημα της Δύσεως. Φυσικά πάντοτε υπάρχουν διαφορές, διότι ο συντηρητισμός εστιάζει στο έθνος κράτος, αλλά έχουμε και πάρα πολλά κοινά, υπό την έννοια ότι η λέλαπα της αριστεράς εξαπλώνεται παντού και αποδομεί ε, εν συνόλο το δυτικό πολιτισμό. Θέλω λοιπόν σε αυτό το σημείο να καλησπερίσω τη Δάφνη Νούση, η οποία ε, το έκανε όλο αυτό εφικτό, έκανε τις επαφές και μπόρεσε και κανόνισε αυτή τη συνέντευξη. Δάφνη, καλησπέρα. Καλησπέρα, παιδιά. Καλησπέρα, Ραφαήλ. Χαίρομαι πάρα πολύ για αυτή την εκπομπή ε, και ελπίζω να τη βρει ενδιαφέρον για το κοινό μας. Ναι, κοίταξε. Θα, πιστεύω ότι σίγουρα θα τη βρει, διότι αυτοί οι οποίοι ε, μιλούν και ακούνε αγγλικά ε, έχει, θα έχει αυτή τη δυσκολία η συγκεκριμένη εκπομπή, θα σας υποσχόμαστε ότι θα προσπαθήσουμε να υποτιτλήσουμε την εκπομπή. Πάντοτε χρειαζόμαστε εθελοντές για να βοηθήσουν όχι μόνο στον υποτιτλισμό αλλά και στον συντονισμό των υποτίτλων. Άλλωστε, οι εκπομπές μας βασίζονται σε προσωπική προσπάθεια αλλά και ταυτόχρονα στη βοήθεια εθελοντών οι οποίοι ενδιαφέρονται να προχωρήσει αυτό το εγχείρημα. Δάφνη, για πες μας τουλάχιστον στα ελληνικά, γιατί θα ρωτήσουμε και τον Νίκ, τι είναι το turning point, δηλαδή τι είναι αυτό το οποίο το ξεχωρίζει ως ε, κίνηση, κίνημα, οργάνωση, πώς θα το χαρακτηρίζεις καταρχάς. Λοιπόν, θα πω καταρχάς πώς ξεκίνησα και πώς βρήκα το turning point. Έρχομαι στην Αγγλία, στο King's College. Ε, ήθελα οπωσδήποτε να ασχοληθώ με τα συνδικαλιστικά ε, πολιτικά του Πανεπιστημίου, κυρίως στο συντηρητικό χώρο. Και φυσικά έψαξα τα δύο το κόμμα με τους Young Conservatives και το Turning Point, το οποίο το παρακολουθούσα εδώ και πάρα πολλά χρόνια. Οπότε που ξεκίνησα από Γιατί είχε μια πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα δράση στα κοινωνικά δίκτυα. Η αλήθεια είναι ότι οι Young Conservatives πραγματικά ήταν... Uh, και σήμερα, που είμαι εδώ πέρα σχεδόν 1,5 χρόνο, δεν είχα σχεδόν καθόλου επαφέ. Είναι πολύ ανοργάνωτη και σαν ένα κομμάτι του συντηρητικού κόμματο που πραγματικά 
ε, δεν έχουν κάνει καμία δράση. Από την άλλη, το turning point με το οποίο είμαι σε επαφή, με το που έστειλα ένα να cover letter φέρει και τι θα, τι θα ήθελα να κάνω μέσα από το turning point ακτιβιστικά, ε, που εγώ τους είχα πει ότι ενδιαφέρομαι πάρα πολύ για το κομμάτι του making. Επικοινώνησαν κατευθείαν μαζί μου στο WhatsApp. Ε, κανονίσαμε μια επαφή μέσω Zoom, έτσι γνώρισα τον Nick, σιγά σιγά ασχολήθηκα με άλλε δράσεις του Turning Point, γνώρισα παιδιά μέσα από το Turning Point. Ε, ήταν, ένα από τα καλά που μου έδωσε ήταν ότι κάνουν training αιτιακά και εκ του σύνεγγι σε διάφορα πανεπιστήμια έτσι ώστε να δημιουργήσουν στελέχη ικανά να προωθήσουν το μήνυμα του συγκυρίτη, το οποίο το είχα βρει πάρα ενδιαφέρον σαν δράση και μου έδωσε κάποια skills, ας πούμε, τα οποία ενδεχομένως να μπορούμε να, να μεταφέρουμε και στην Ελλάδα αύριο μεθαύριο. Αλλά ε, βρήκα, Ραφαήλ, αυτό που μου άρεσε με τα παιδιά και με την επικοινωνία μας είναι η συνειδητοποίηση ότι ο συντηρητικό διάλογος και τα προβλήματα που αντιμετωπίζουν πολύ κοινά. Δηλαδή, μπορεί 100% τα προβλήματα που έχει το κάθε κράτο ακριβώ επειδή πιστεύουμε στο Έθνο κράτο είναι διαφορετικά εσωτερικά, σε ένα πολύ μεγάλο βαθμό συμπίπτει ο διάλογο. Και το ερώτημα είναι, υπάρχουν σημεία καμπή στα οποία θα μπορούσαμε να κάνουμε κάποιε συνεργασίε, θα μπορούσαμε να προωθήσουμε ένα κοινό μήνυμα, το turning point σε μερικά κομμάτια στα οποία είναι πάρα πολύ πετυχημένο. Και γι' αυτό λοιπόν, μέσα από αυτού του προβληματισμού, ε, είχαμε αρκετά κοντά με τον Νίκ, γιατί ενδιαφέρθηκε ο άνθρωπο για αυτά τα ζητήματα. Και του πρότεινα την εκπομπή, μα έψαξε, του άρεσε η δουλειά του Δίεση και του Ride to the Bone. Τον έχουμε εδώ σήμερα ε, για να συζητήσουμε αυτά τα πράγματα. Να ξέρετε, παιδιά, θα κοιτάω αρκετά το chat, οπότε αν έχετε γενικά κάποιε απορίε, θα χαρώ πάρα πολύ να δω τι ερωτήσει και να το τι θέσουμε. Ε, το έχουμε στο νου μα. Και νομίζω ότι είναι μια πλήρη εικόνα με το τι είναι και πώ ασχολήθηκα εγώ με αυτό βασικά. Να βάλουμε τώρα στη συζήτηση τον Παναγιώτη Δουμά, ο οποίο ε, θα μα πει, θα κάνει ένα. Μία... Ένα προλογισμό, ας πούμε, του Νίκ Τενγκόνη, ε, για να, ε, να συζητήσουμε μαζί του. Παναγιώτη. Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Ε, έψαξα λίγο τις δράσεις ε, του Turning Point UK. Ε, πραγματικά είναι κάτι το οποίο ίσως θα ήταν πάρα πολύ δύσκολο να γίνει στην Ελλάδα. Είναι καλό ότι έχουμε ένα χαμηλό μέσο ρολικίας στους ε, τηλεθεατές Τη εκπομπή μα, ίσω αυτό να παρακινούσε κάποιου να ξεκινήσουν να σκέφτονται τέτοιε ενέργειε. Θα δείτε ένα παράδειγμα μια τέτοια δράση. Έχει πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον, διότι εδώ δεν μιλάμε για ακτιβισμό έτσι όπω εννοείται συνήθω, τύπου ρουβίκονα ή κάτι τέτοιο. Μιλάμε για έναν εντελώ ήπιο και πολιτισμένο, να το πω έτσι, ακτιβισμό, ο οποίο όμω δείχνει να έχει και πολύ μεγάλο, μεγάλη αποτελεσματικότητα. Έχει και χιούμορ. Και νομίζω ότι το καλύτερο που έχουμε να κάνουμε είναι να παίξουμε ένα μικρό απόσπασμα από ένα από τα βίντεο, μία από τις δράσεις που έχει κάνει ο Νίκ Τενκόνη σε ένα πανεπιστήμιο, όπου εισήλθε με μία σημαία της Σοβιετικής Ενώσεως και ήθελε να διαπιστώσει πόση ώρα θα παραμείνει ανενόχλητος να κουνάει τη σημαία μέσα στο πανεπιστήμιο και να φωτογραφίζεται με διαφόρους οι οποίοι έσπευσαν φυσικά χαρούμενοι να βγουν φωτογραφία μαζί με τη Σοβιετική σημαία. Ε, ας μην συνεχίσουμε με λόγια, να το βάλουμε, να το δούμε.
Where well, it said gulag. <laughs> gulag. Oh, mate, wait, I want the gulag. Yes, yeah, jump in. Get in there. Come gulag. on, guys. Here we go. Everybody say 100 million dead. <laughs> <laughs>Soviet Union flag, um, which is, I think, a sample, first of all, of the activism that uh, Turning Point uh, UK is engaged uh, with. And I, I would say it is a smart activism. It's not, um, you know, um, something that goes uh, to the edges. Of course, if it was done um, in a Greek university, then I don't know how many of us who would be alive uh, today to to host this show. Uh, but <laughs> uh, the thing is that uh, what you are saying is true, that an ideology uh, like the communist ideology uh, that has resulted to 100 million uh, dead uh, is something that is uh, accepted widely, uh, not only in the UK, of course, in Greece as well, and uh, on, in the whole Western world. So my first question, of course, is um, what is, briefly, uh, Turning Point UK? And second of all, um, why do you think that the left um, has won the war? Uh, until now on ideas sure okay well thanks very much for having me guys it's a pleasure to be here so obviously that video so my youtube videos have just gone past 1.5 million so um i i have a, an incredible support network in the form of our ceo um and um and some other key individuals some associates of the firm so i'm very lucky but the reality is is that we get off our behinds and we go and we go and do something yeah this is this is what thatcher said go and do something yeah stop talking don't stop thinking but go and do something yeah so that's what we do so thank you you've obviously um well you've nailed it in terms of what we do and in terms of who we are that video did really well we all laugh because actually it's hilarious and our editing team is world class but how terrifying is that video how sad is that video that's sussex university which is i'm not sure whether it's russell group or not i thought that it was and we also know about Kathleen Stock down there who was harassed with regards to her views on trans. She was harassed to the point where she had to have bodyguards and I believe she was removed from campus. So we know about the LGB movement against trans, but this is happening, this indoctrination, this level of nonsense. You know, you saw when, when I was being an agitator and I said things like say gulag and hundred million dead, they didn't stop and think and reflect or feel shame. It's social contagion. It's socialism rebranded once again. No thinking, no awareness. So we all laugh at that video. It's hilarious. It's a great video, but how terrifying and how sad. But anyway, thank you for that intro. In terms of Turning Point UK, we are leading the charge. No other firm in the UK does what we do. And yes, of course, it's activism through and through. So what does that look like in the digital age, in the 21st century, in the cultural war, where we face um, immense opposition from media, um, from grassroots, from liberals, from fake conservatives, from from a, from an infidel government, you can't get you can't get more enemies than that. You know, there's red dots absolutely everywhere at conservatives. So when we talk about activism, we talk about online activism. So as much as I might hate the digital age for everything good that it brings, I try and um, 
I, I try and get behind that. Unfortunately, it does bring a lot of ills, but of course, online activism is a massive part of um, some of the good stuff. So we recruit and we say to people, look, are you common sense? Are you pro-free market? Are you socially conservative? Are you happy that your brothers and sisters are being bullying, bully, being bullied all over the world, vilified? And I'm happy to break down the left's, um, which as a side note, I don't think happens often enough, break down the left's agenda. It's very important to deconstruct their tactics because their tactics are despicable. There's no honour in their tactics whatsoever. It, and it's what it boils down to council culture and, um, and defaming as well. So it's all about bullying. It's all, and it's a really nasty war. So we lead the charge via activism. And to be honest with you, in terms of what I've learned since joining the firm with regards to what's called the Young Conservative Movement or YC, and in terms of um, our universities, so that's our Tory SOC or conservative um, presidents of those societies, I don't see any action. And I've been assessing and I've been putting myself in the trenches. I've been putting myself in harm's way so that I have empirical field based evidence. So activism is what we do. We do that media. We do that online. We do it via our graphics and we do it at street level as well. Uh, I have Nick? a question, please. Oh. <clears throat> as Rafael said before, uh, in Greece, it's much worse, uh, especially with communists <coughs> and leftists in the universities. And the question is, have you faced any violent reactions uh, during your activities uh, in uh, British universities? So first of all, on that, I noticed that it was mentioned a second ago that how bad it is in, in Greece. I want to learn more about that. Directly answering your question, and this is quite important because of my training and how I present myself, it's very unlikely that it will turn physical because I do have training. And I think if you'll allow me just to... Uh, paint the picture. There are certain people that are easier targets. Um, I, I do stick out like a sore thumb, but I'll explain to you what happens in the UK. So in the UK, we have Antifa, which is an anti-fascist movement, which is a fascist movement. So it's really ironic, really weird. But then the left, the left and the far left don't care about logical reason. It's all about feelings, as we know, and facts don't matter. So what they'll do is they'll dress up in what's called black block, and there's a little Antifa playbook they've got, their little Disney playbook that they circulate to their followers. And Twitter, Twitter is a fascist hangout, yeah? It's a far left commie hangout. And hopefully Elon Musk is, is going to do something about that. But I've gone down the rabbit hole and I've researched it, guys. And they do, they have a little playbook that was probably written by someone who's trans or somebody who's mentally unwell. They've actually written the book and they've said, make sure you cover your face when you go to rallies. Make sure you wear balaclavas. Now, I don't know what the UK government is doing, saying that it's legal to wear balaclavas in the street. I don't know what's happened to this great country that it's legal. And of course, we, I could drag pandemic and COVID into this because of face coverings. It's now legitimized, especially in the cold weather, everybody to cover their face. So I'll give you some mm. examples. In, and and that, that, that's a whole different topic that needs to be addressed with regards to legalities. You, you, you can't be allowed to walk around covering your face. And Antifa openly have written a little playbook, a little commie playbook, saying, be a coward, cover your face, make sure you can't be identified. It's disgusting. There's no honour in that. It's vile. Let's have a conversation. Don't take it to that place. You shouldn't be violent. But don't cover your face. I'll give you some examples. In Manchester, I think it was March of this year, they, they turn up in Black Block and it's called milkshaking. So they'll go to McDonald's. They'll grab the big milkshake and from about 10, 15 yards, they'll throw it at you and your stand and your table and your your marketing and you. So the idea is, is that what they've done is essentially they've kind of closed your day up because what they've done is they haven't assaulted you. I, I'm not a lawyer. And also, I don't care about stuff like that. I, I find it funny and I'm happy to give you some more ev evidence of how I react and how I behave. So not violence, but very clever. How did they know we were there? How did they get someone dressed in black block so quickly? How did they get someone there so quickly? So if I rock up at a university at 11 o'clock in the morning and this happens at four, you could argue if they are mobilized and they clearly are, then what did it take them so long? Is it because they couldn't be bothered and they're actually very, very ignorant and they're not that clever? Or is it just lone people acting on their own? And of course, those lone people are weaponized now because of the social justice movement. So I'll throw the milkshake, it goes all over the board, all over you. They'll do it from about 15 yards away and then they run. As fast as they can, they run. Now, of course, as conservatives and British, we smile and we go, oh, OK, fine. So I can't call that violence, but I'll give you another example. In Bristol, which is a Marxist hellhole, uh, there's an issue there with something called the um, uh, the Coulston statue, where in uh, summer of 2020, 
because of something to do with a career criminal called George Floyd in the US, a load of lefties in Bristol, because they are devout commies and they're the sort of people that don't really have jobs, they don't really work, and they're just very angry at life. They decided to mobilise and pull down a statue and Avon and Somerset um, Council and the mayor and the police, they decided to say, yep, yeah, we're going to allow this to happen. We're going to allow for mass fear, mass destruction. You've got violent disorder, affray, you name it. We're going to allow for all this in the name of social justice. So I've been down there to cover the statue. I've been down there tabling, being active, and I've been down there filming as well. And what they do is, as soon as you put the GB flag up, as soon as you put that up, they turn up on their little bicycles. These are grown men of fighting age. They turn up on their little bicycles and they stand there in groups and they shout at you and they point and they say Nazi. They say neo-Nazi. They say fascist. But they won't debate. They won't talk. So, again, are these people weaponized? Yes. Are they mobilized? Yeah. Are they on someone's payroll? My opinion, 100 percent. These people are motivated. They're inspired. They're getting paid. I do. I know enough about people and business to know from these attacks. And I've got plenty more as well. I was at Southampton University the other day and I was with a trans. I think it's called a trans woman. So basically he was a man and he had um, he had the uh, he had the mask on and he was covered. And I said, take that off and we can have a conversation. He said, no, I'm doing it to protect myself. So we don't get violence. God willing, touch wood. We don't get violence. But I will say this, friends, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. So, uh, Nick, I will tell you what, what, what is happening, what is going on um, in the Greek universities. Um, the, first of all, um, political parties are um, inside the Greek universities as young, um, as, you know, a, a young political parts of young people that represent each party in Greece. And they are inside the universities and uh, are not separate in a separate uh, building or example or a se separate legal status as it is in the UK because I also uh, studied uh, at a um, UK university so I know what's happening and I know things are far better. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the Antifa in Greece is Antifa but without milkshakes, but with Molotovs. So oh, wow. Molotov. <laughs> so that, wow. that, that's a critical point, and that's that's a different point. So, wow, um, that's terrifying. Yes, yeah, so that's terrifying, and it it was only now uh, with this uh, government that um, there was a vote uh, to have police um, that will intervene when things happen inside. Uh, the Greek universities, but um, that doesn't happen often because they wait from uh, the BOD of the university uh, to call or summon the police. So in practice, there is no protection at all uh, for different uh, opinions, nothing. Yeah. So um, it is very difficult for that kind of smart activism that you are engaged uh, with to um, you know to to take place in Greece especially happens but in other uh, places as well so um, it is good uh, that you have the room um, in order to um, pass on your ideas because um, you know uh, what, what you did there it was that you humiliated them um, in a clever way because you said uh, 100 million dead, Gulag, and as you said in the beginning, no one reacted. No one reacted and they thought that, that it is natural. So um, they, they are not uh, you know, accustomed to say Nazis and communists are the same thing. And, and if we don't engage in this uh, cultural war, um, there is no hope at all for the West. But I, I, I noted um, the words that you have used, honor, that I think is um, you know, a basic component of uh, what conservatism means, in my opinion. Honor is, um, is a word that uh, has been uh, forsaken in the West for a long time ago. You know, it is 
it is empty of it 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 is empty of meaning it, it doesn't mean anything to anyone anymore all we talk about is contracts and all this stuff but no one talks about honor so i think that it is a very a very critical and of high importance word that you have used uh, but um i think uh, panagiotis will uh, put the other video that you explain with three words uh, what conservatism means just eight seconds in some seconds for us to talk about sure. what you think um, a contemporary conservative stands what does for. right wing so, mean yeah. to you oh, conservative question. what does conservative mean to you um family faith freedom simple as family faith yeah. freedom that's um, it. That's it. Yeah. So, um, does uh, a young guy, uh, the young generation that is now in the universities, have a, a hope of be turned to to be a conservative? What what, what does contemporary conservative mean for you? Uh, with a little bit more words, you know. Yeah, so, so this is this is this is perfect. So this is this is this is the epicenter of the nucleus. This is the actual core that we need to start talking about, and it happens to be my specialism. So at university, it was international relations and third world war and realism and Marxism. That was my specialty, and now I've specialized in the culture war. And with for all the influencers that have their far reach, this incredible reach, um, and I wanted to talk to you about this specifically, guys. These influencers, again, you could argue it's, it's, a, it's a good aspect of the digital age. It depends who's influencing because there's so much lefty Marxist propaganda out there that's, that's brainwashing rather than common sense and this godlessness. This is what we have, this huge problem with a lack of honour and godlessness. But it's so important that this video, that I share this with all my contacts, my, all my VIPs, so I do this. I, all I do is explain what the left are doing, how they're doing it. I deconstruct it. So it's, it's facts over feelings every day of the week and twice on Sundays. You've got to deconstruct what they're doing. You need to inspire and motivate these people. So throw in liberalism, throw in weak fathers, beta male fathers, throw in women's lib, which of course has a fantastic place with regards to a, uh, degrees of equality and fairness, of course. But where has what, what's happened to our fathers? What has happened to our generation? You can see it all the time. I'm going to give my, my nine-year-old a smartphone. I'm going to give my 13-year-old a phone. Oh, why? What, you, you've got to be crazy, right? Well, because all the other kids have got one. I don't care. I don't care. I got a phone at 15. Why on earth are you giving a child at nine a phone, regardless of whether it's smart or not? Beta males, liberal parenting, godlessness. So in terms of your question, obviously, you know, it's really the epicenter of things. So all I try and do is to deconstruct the left's nonsense and their satanic, woke craziness. And it really is. And I try and inspire and motivate the grassroots. OK, that, that's that's it could be any age group. So we talk about family, faith, freedom. We talk about godlessness. We talk about the effects of the digital age. We talk about what conservatism actually means. I'm trying to inspire and motivate these young men and women, my brothers and sisters, regardless of um, the fact that I'm Italian or the regardless of where anyone came from. I talk about patriotism. I talk about the dangers of socialism. I talk about the benefits of free market economics, not American corporatism. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about capitalism, I'm talking about growth, productivity, I'm talking about efficiency and remo removing the bureaucratic red tape nonsense that lefty socialist communist, whatever you want to call it, madness bogs our systems down with. So it's very important that the influencers and the people who have the, the massively far reach don't just talk and go into that Westminster bubble where they just talk and they pontificate. You become a liberal very easily overnight. A man's defined by his juicy. And we've got this massive, massive gap between the Zeds. And you can talk about gaming and you can talk about social media. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. You, you, you know, the, the, the family home molds and breeds and grooms the children. That's what happens. You, you teach right. them right and wrong. Nick, because you've mentioned some things that are very important, I will present now um, a research um, that was done uh, and was released um, 
from the independent. Um, one moment, here it is. So, about the UK. Uh, UK increasingly multicultural as one in 10 homes contain people of two or more ethnicities. And of course, it has many interesting facts here. Um, for example, uh, the, the one that was quite shocking to me because you uh, spoke about uh, godlessness is this one. The proportion of the population of England and Wales describing themselves as Christian has fallen below half for the first time with 46.2% uh, to 27.5 million people describing the, the, themselves as such. This is a 13.1 percentage point decrease from 2011. And of course, um, a multicultural society, um, what, what it, what, what it actually means is that there isn't um, a nation, an, a national um, common ground, um, the so-called melting pot that unites all British. So how did we, how did the UK um, reach to this point? First of all, that's my first question. And second of all, um, is this uh, accepted from the vast majority of British people? So uh, there's lots to say on this, uh, but I'll, I'll do your questions first. So who's to blame? In 97, a guy called Tony Blair got into power. Um, I think it was probably what you might call Labour's turn. There are cycles of these things, but there shouldn't be a massive showstopper to conservatism. But he came in right before the tech rev, right before the digital age. He was very charismatic and he had his new education or new labor policy, education, education, education policy. And, you know, he did really well. And what he did was he decided he decided that I'm going to take labor. So I'm going to take the socialists. I'm going to take these ridiculous terms like center right and center left. And and I hear I'm a I'm a red conservative and I'm a blue um, labor. It, it's absolute nonsense. and I won't enable it. And what he did was he said, I'm going to produce a center ground, which produced the centrist, which is what I call a liberal. It's used more in the US. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make them weak. I'm going to make them apathetic. And I'm going to do that by essentially producing this middle ground. Pick a, you have to pick a side in life. You have to. Yeah. So that's why I talk about right wing versus left wing. And you have extremes on both sides. We've got right wing versus left wing. Simple. And you can do that economically, you can do that culturally. So Tony Blair was very, very clever in what he did. He also decided to decimate the Middle East um, unlawfully. Nick, Nick, sorry, sorry for interrupting. But before reaching Blair, there was uh, a political elite consensus about what happened from the immigration, regarding the immigration from the Commonwealth. Because if because I have studied uh, public opinion, the public opinion of the UK, uh, when mass immigration uh, from the Commonwealth took place, okay, vast immigration. I don't mean a percentage that is acceptable and um, you know can uh, can incorp can can assimilate with the UK people, but a vast majority uh, of immigrants that came from the from the Commonwealth, and most people in the UK disagreed, and the political elite, both from the centre right or the right, and the left, agreed. You may say it was uh, Enoch Powell that disagreed, but uh, what was um, um, you know? What, what the British people, I think, found out after many years was that um, the, um, uh, the Conservative Party, the Tories, um, you know, allowed people like Enoch Powell that I don't say they didn't believe what they were talking and what, 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 what they were preaching, but they were being used from the Tories in order... Um, to uh, have voters from the right wing of the Conservative Party. So 
maybe it started before Tony Blair and the Conservative Party had also a share to, uh, you know, of the blame. Do you agree with that or do you think you yeah. disagree? No, not at all. So, Raphael, it very much depends on what your question is. So, uh, you, you brought up, obviously, you're asking very, very important, very, um, very broad. Uh, this is this is huge what you're talking about, you know, when we go to the culture war. So, here's, here's, here's how I'll break it down, right? There's those that buy the gun, buy the bullets, load the gun, and then there's those who pull the trigger. Does that make sense? That's yes. how I would break it down. In terms of In terms of the legal side, I will always hold Tony Blair's government to account in terms of throwing petrol on the fire, in terms of accelerating, in terms of the, the 2004 Gender Recognition Act. And um, there's, there's various different sections of the act and also on, on um, policing and in the public and what the CPS did as a result. I, I, and um, Keir Starman, who's currently leader of the Labour Party, his involvement. So that 97 to 2010 period, if we're placing blame, it goes there because when you destabilize the Middle East, guess what? All the refugees are going to come knocking on your door and it's a perfect business model, isn't it? So I was reading today about just brushing up on Tony Blair and Jack Straw and it's all going to come out just like with Iraq. It will all come out. Somehow Tony Blair will get away with it, but it's all going to come out. The idea was to start a movement that essentially allowed the left to point at the right and say, you're racist, you're fascist. It's right out of the Frankfurt School. It's right out of the commie playbook. It's all there. So do, do we trust the Conservative Party? Do I, do, are, are, they, are they filled with liberals? You know, you know, I, I'm hanging in there with a couple of key backbenchers. But look, you know, when when did immigration start? I, I, well, I'm not a historian, but look, listen, hey, we're a species and we have this thing called planet Earth. So as soon as you invented the plane, people would fly. As soon as you invented the boat, people would sail. The reality is it's called migration. You know, it, it is my, my ancestors came from Italy. It is what it is. So I don't know when it started. and I don't care. What I do care about is in terms of the legalities of things. You obviously educated man yourself. You know what the situation is with regards to immigration in the UK at the moment. And I can't speak intelligently about Greece because I'm not there. But in the UK, the system is rigged so that we exist in a culture war, which we are on the back foot on. That is our government. So our government... And it's all to do with law. It's all to do with law enforcement. It's all to do with legal and the small print. It's all to do with that legislation. Of course it is. That we are now set up to fail. You're talking about diseased soil. So you know about the, the effect of the Euro European Court on Human Rights. And you know about the small boats arriving in August. I, again, I, I reach out to all the influencers and all the people who are in a position of prominence. Stop quoting. Stop talking and actually go and do something because because i i've heard it all that's what people do they drop quotes they do numbers i i understand all that so i could tell you that in april seven thousand arrived yeah that's seven thousand that we know of so what's what's the point here illegal immigrants are bypassing the system and saying i deserve to be here but i i come from albania it's not a war-torn country you're an economic migrant you can queue like everyone else and you can also queue when our public services are dealing with our own population because we're at saturation we're at total saturation. So in terms of, the, you can talk about the Labour Party, it's a two-party system in the UK, talk about the Labour Party or the Conservative Party. Who pulled the trigger on all this? It was Tony Blair's government between 97 and 2010. All right, uh, Daphne? Yes, um, first of all, thank you for, for your thoughts. I mean, I really find it very engaging all of you, what you say. I'd like to, to point out some things that we've been discussing together here in the UK. And it's the conservative allegiance. So the thing is that in every Western country nowadays, we all conservatives face the same problems regarding what's happening culturally, what's happening with the opponents, all the right wing parties are, are you know ha having so many liberals inside the, the clans and the teams. So the question is, how do we fight back? Are we having any chances of winning? what can we do apart from you know having simple activism is there, is there anything more that we can do and regarding you know turning point which is a, a very winning brand worldwide and are there possibilities that we can work together and have you know little turning points all over europe or maybe in greece and you know create activists online activists at least if not at universities and you know see some potential so I'd really like to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. Of course. 
So Turning Point, as I said in the beginning when I was kindly intro, Turning Point UK, the Turning Point brand is really leading the global charge. It really is in the face of, I think that's the fourth time I've been asked whether the culture war can be won or not. And I keep swerving the question. Um, the, 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 in terms of the odds and the numbers, it doesn't look good, guys. If you, if you, if you work it back, they're coming for Christianity. They're coming for the church. They're coming for conservatism. The, the media is completely woke. Our institutions are completely woke. Our government, uh, apart from a few solid backbenchers, utterly useless. You can't undo what's been happening since the 1950s. It was completely unregulated. It's just gotten worse and worse. Enoch Powell warned us about this. He warned us what would happen. And guess what? It will happen. OK, that, that's it. He warned us. So ca can we win? Let me put it to you like this. There is no way that I'm not going to die fighting. There's no way a man knows his duty and it's facts over feelings. Remember, remember what I said every day of the week and twice on Sunday. OK, so I don't know the outcome. But what I find fascinating is, is that, again, people talk about the culture war endlessly. It's a war. There's no knives. There's no guns. I know you mentioned about some homemade bombs and all that kind of just insane stuff. But there's no it's not cinematic. There's nothing on the battlefield. And we need to start talking more common sense about this from the right people need to start talking about it. We have a reach of five million a month across 300,000 people across four platforms. So, yeah, we are leading the charge. And what a fantastic time to be alive as well. It's not a bad thing. We're in a culture war. We're being tested by God. This is a, this is a fantastic time to be alive. We're not weak. We're not scared. And unfortunately, going back to some of the earlier questions, obviously, conservatives are running scared now. They are scared. They don't know their duty. They don't know their honor. And of course, it's not over for them. It's not over for us. So can the war be won? I don't know. But what I do know is, is that to your point, this is where I'm coming to, Daphne, we are not unified and we need to be unified. And Turning Point gives us that opportunity. So obviously, I speak with good people like yourselves. And we try and speak to other people in the media and network, etc. But until people actually go and do something and fight back at street level, until people actually go and do something, it's kind of it, it's 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 taking your odds from from not good to well, it's not even going to work, is it? So yes, there are franchise opportunities. That's definitely a conversation we can have. I'm more interested in talking about a conservative allegiance. And with that, I'd like to talk to you about the Conservative Pledge. I thought you might ask me the question you've asked me. We've launched the Conservative Pledge with our president, MP Marco Longy. That's in Dudley North, uh, near Birmingham in the UK, guys. Now, he, he, is, he is somebody who is leading the charge inside Westminster. He is standing up for what he believes in. He is unrelenting. He will not back down. And he has support. He's found a lot of support just in the last six months. I know I'm involved. He's found a lot of support because he spoke out. And there are other MPs, there are other backbenchers as well who have the same vision as, that he does. Good, solid, strong men and women who have the same vision. <coughs> they do. Okay, so what, what, you know, what can we do? Can it be won? We're networking, obviously. And, and getting, if you get an opportunity, this is, goes out to all the young conservatives that I do. This is what I do all day, every day. If you're given an opportunity, take it network do something make contact get active you need to be able to hold your own at street level when i table guys i can tell you now when i'm doing the economics of socialism versus capitalism if i have young conservatives with me or if i have a little crowd when it gets heated those conservatives they stay in the background they don't want to get involved they're terrified because yeah, I mean that, that's what the left and antifa do that's what they do and that's what commies do is they try and they force you into submission. But what man would allow that? What man would allow to be bullied? You stand up to bullies as a man. It's a defining characteristic of knowing your duty. Of course you do. You stand up for those vulnerable and, and to bullies as well. But but you've I can't force everyone to do that. They must realise that they have to fight back in this war. Because it's already hard enough, if that makes sense so far. I, I would have... Oh, I really liked the fact, one of the first meetings in London League, it was your really enthusiasm and passion, uh, an ardent passion about this when you when you taught me, when, when I asked you, will you fight till the end? Or will, you, will you go all, all the way? And you were like, I will go, I, I mean, I, I, over my dead, dead body, I, I, they want, they want, uh, you know, the, you were you were very passionate about it and i really liked it and what i deserve is that the conservatives don't have the courage to stand 
to start up for what they believe. And I think one of the one of the main points that Turning Point can do is give the conservatives and the young students the uh, the opportunity to strengthen themselves and the spiritual reserve to get in the political battlefield at the end of the day. Because you really need to be very very strong in order to to, to fight back. Because again, you have the academics, the professors who are in this work movement, you've got your family perhaps, you've got the TV, you, everything is work. So you must be ensure that you're not alone in, uh, in what's coming. This is so important, guys, so important. And and I, I won't speak for too long on this because I'm I, essentially I'm just echoing what I just said. It's about bravery. I talk to people about courage. I talk about duty is more important than happiness. Somewhere along the line, I wasn't brought up like this in the 80s. It's not that long ago. So I don't understand what's happened other, uh, apart from beta males and soft liberal parenting. And that's why I emphasize that point about the creation. I'm not saying Tony Blair created the centrist, but it does. It sits you in the middle. It sits you on the fence and it forces you to say, well, I'm not going to take a stand. The state looks like it's doing really well and I'm going to let them run with it. And this is, this is socialism 101. Don't worry, guys. We know better than you do. They don't. Well, they Nick, Nick, what you are saying is that uh, what you are saying now and uh, throughout all this um, this show is that the, the left would blame you that uh, um, you represent a toxic masculine guy. So, uh, what what would you reply to that? Thank you. <laughs> That's generally what I'm saying. Okay. I, I have an, I, I have another question. So you describe the situation, uh, which is in Britain, but actually everywhere. <coughs> uh, but there are some differences. Uh, first of all, Britain has a party called Conservative Party, and we are talking all this time about conservatives, but they but they don't seem to be the same thing as this party anymore. That's correct. Uh, yeah. And uh, for me, uh, everything has a. a um, Everything is important. Of course, fighting like that, fighting back like that is important. But in the end of the day, if there is no uh, political representation for these people, um, furthermore, if there is a party call, calling itself conservative and being liberal, um, that's, that's a problem. And that's the difference of Britain um, uh, if you compare it with other countries where we see that uh, recently conservative uh, forces are uh, leading or touching the top like uh, France like Italy and other countries Germany Austria are in a good way or uh, Sweden uh, even here in Greece uh, maybe there are many parties and there comes the thing that you said about unity uh, but uh, if, if you add the percentages of all these parties, you have a very big percentage, a, 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 very, a very big rate, very high rate. It's over 10%, 15% for a start. Um, so uh, my question is, do you agree that there must be also a political representation for all these people, even in, in Great Britain? And uh, I would like also to hear, uh, hear your opinion about uh, the rest of Europe and other countries, the examples I named. So I think what's really important to know is that, again, there, there's these reoccurring questions on the show, which is very important about, you know, what, what happens next? Will we win the culture war? What do we do? And d this woke nonsense, is it supported by the British public? It's the, same, it's the same line of questioning. The British public does not support what's happening in any way. Westminster has become a mafia. It's become an untouchable mafia. We have political apathy and ignorance at an all-time high. The last few elections were votes of no confidence. So going back to that stat about Christianity, we're looking at a 13% drop down to 46%. Yeah, that's with regard to those who were surveyed. We're also talking about an aging population where godlessness wasn't tolerated. We're talking about the war lot. So again, I don't, I don't want to get bogged down in the numbers and, and stats and things like that because the media, all of our enemies, the media is one of them, they are, want to convince conservatives that it's over. It's not over. That's nonsense. So to your point with regards to, you know, um, uh, other parts of Europe. So we've got uh, Maloney in Italy. We've got um, a Swedish right wing government now. We've got um, Orban in Hungary. You mentioned some other places as well. So I've I use Orban as the example. So what I'm dubbing is what's called the new right. And I'm trying to get traction with that. 
and again i need other people's help with that okay so this is this is the important part of the show whoever watches this and yeah i'm in contact with a lot of different people but it's very important that we address what you guys you're not just suggesting it you're also i think you're saying it openly the the will of that we are a conservative species we are an inherently conservative species god fearing and that is that is the will of the people it is but the media and corporate and all these other critical institu institutions have now got their woke hands on people's salaries and their lives and people are terrified i cannot tell you if i had a pound for every time i've spoken to a liberal who agrees with me they do that sit on the fence thing but if i had a pound for every time i've had this conversation with a liberal or a center right or a centrist or a center left and they actually completely agree but they're terrified of being cancelled. So whether you call it wokeism, woke, far left, Marxism, it's now in our institutions. It's now here. So a different question would be, is it too late? Well, yeah, it's 100% too late. It depends how it depends which way the outcome goes. So let's look at Orban's country. Let's look at Hungary, for example, incentivizing via tax breaks to have families, large families, so that nobody can talk anymore about immigration issues. No one can talk about backfilling labor shortages, which I've got a massive issue with because it comes with all sorts of societal problems, such as the brain drain. Why should we have, why do we have the right to take the best from another country, bring them here to our country? That's not very fair on that country, is it? I think that's awful. We should be celebrating that actually this is our land, that's your land. And obviously, you know, welcome to come and visit or even apply for some sort of permanent residency. But to take the best from a country and bring them over, I think that's an appalling argument. But the left use it freely and they do it in the name of social justice. So Orban's one example. But to your point, we need to mobilize and conservatives. And I, I, I try and think of a classier way of saying this, but conservatives generally are concerned with taking the moral high ground. They don't like getting their hands dirty, whereas the left do. And this has been a massive, massive issue for so many decades now, which is why I do what I do and why we lead the charge. We know that once someone's inspired and motivated, they tell their friend and then they tell their mum and dad. And then but degrees of separation. All of a sudden, you've got a conservative movement that's been created across Europe and the world. Look at the social justice movement. George Floyd was a career criminal that got killed by a white psychopathic cop in the US. What's that got to do with the rest of the world? What's that got to do with the UK? But in summer of 2020, when they were rioting and protesting, it had everything to do with it. They're weaponized. They're mobilized. Are they on the payroll? Maybe. Well, all right, then. There's nothing wrong with that. Free market enterprise. We've got to get active. But obviously, we can't do it on our own. And I can't. We, you know, the management at Turning Point UK can't do it on our own, no matter how much we liaise with the US. It's very, very important that we create this pledge, this association this conglomerate. Again, that's why I've made all those other subtle points, guys, about standing up to bullies, about courage, about godlessness and the problems that it brings. And all these other items, again, unpacking the left's agenda and, and, and also placing blame with conservatives and not letting them get away with it, calling out fake conservatives and liberals and calling out the conservative party. So there's endless scope for everyone to start going. There's nothing to be scared of, actually. Actually, there's safety in numbers. But we haven't done that. No conservative prime minister. And I'll, I'll give you one more one one more anecdotal point, guys. No conservative prime minister. I've never heard it. I've never heard it come out of their mouths. I've never heard them talk about the culture war or the dangers of wokeism or far left in our institutions. I've never heard it. That's all they should be talking about. Culture first, economy second. Your culture is the most important thing. Money comes and goes. Look at what the Ukrainians are doing. That's courage. That's heart. Regardless of what you think about Russia, it doesn't matter. That's heart. You stay and you fight. You don't flee. You stay and you fight. So we have a massive issue with our culture. Massive issue. Are we unified or are we divided? In the social justice era, are we more unified or divided than ever? Because something has to unite us. And I do that with people. I unpack what it means to be united. And I talk about language, freedom of speech. I talk about core values. I talk about family values. I talk about tradition. I talk about borders and state sovereignty. I unpack what freedom means. The, the youth don't understand it anymore because life's been too good to them. It's been too easy. So we, need, we have a, a monumental task from an educational perspective and from an activism perspective. And, and I'll give you that small anecdote. I was with a prominent conservative MP recently. He was giving a talk. And this guy is treasured. 
he's 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 he is treasured by the conservative lot, the liberal lot. And the actual conservative lot, which is right wing, by the way, yeah, it's conservative for a reason. And I put some tough questions to him. I'm not going to tell you who it was. And I said, I said about in about the invasion, which Suella Braverman has called it, and the uproar to that word, which is nonsensical because that's exactly what it is. These are economic migrants; they're not fleeing war torn countries. It's a joke. And he said, and I quote, "I'm proud of them. I've never got in a small boat and crossed the channel. That takes real courage." <laughs> and, I thought, and I thought to myself, what a clever man. I thought to myself, what a very clever man. And I quake with rage because he's not wrong. I've never got in a small boat. I've pulled some stuff in my life. I've, I, I have. I've never got in a small boat and gone across the English Channel. I've never even swum the English Channel. So a very clever answer. Now, that is from one of the right wing. This guy gets called a Nazi and a fascist daily. I tell you, he's the most right wing we've got. And he said, why wouldn't, why did he say that? Why wouldn't he just condemn it? Why wouldn't he just outright condemn it and say, we're full, we're not paying for it, we're not paying for anyone else until we've got our own situation sorted out? And that's the tip of the spear. Even that's diplomatic. You could go a lot further. That is verbatim from a right wing conservative MP. Well, I, I really hope, I really hope that wasn't Jacob Reed Smart, because I do admire him. So I really hope he wasn't. No, no, no pressure to answer me. Just just a question. Oh, actually, not, not a question. Just a comment on this. I think that conservatives, for the very first time in history, we have to do something that's very contradictory to our very nature, to our fundamentals. For the first time, we're not here to conserve something, but we have to do something and change what's going on. So that's fundamentally contradiction to our very nature as conservatives. So I think one of the reasons that really conservatives not want to get their hands dirty or really don't know how to react in the situation is exactly that point of thing, because we have to change the nature and adapt to the new challenges that this uh, that this world has, has brought us. And by that, I'd like this very simple question. So we might have some interested Greek students, individuals who would like to be trained in online activism and in turning point uh, work. So that we've been doing, Nick, and I've been in the beginning, I mentioned a couple of things that we've been doing. So I'm saying if they get in touch with us and they send us a message in the ESC or in our private accounts, do you think that we can um, we can pass them to you and do something all together? Absolutely. So this is why it's so important. And again, guys, sorry, if I, I, I have deliberately broken it down into bite sized chunks, but it's so important. That's why I said and, and I get asked all the time, who is Turning Point? What do we do? And I use the word activism because everything we do from our graphics on social media and I mentioned our reach, it is activism. It really is. Everything we do, all of our events, all of our public speaking, all of our graphics, all of our tabling sessions at universities, all of our filming, putting ourselves in the trenches in harm's way. It's all activism. So, Daphne, you've nailed it. That's you, you've literally smacked it on top. That's that's it. That's the bullseye. No more Mr. Nice Guy. No more conserve. And we're conservatives. The gloves are off, guys. So, so again, we can quote all day long, can't we? My answer to your question is, of course, yes. And we can talk more about that. But we can quote all day long, can't we? I've got I got loads of stats in front of me. The CEO of um, Humanists UK. I mean, the clues in the title there. I don't I don't know what that means or what they do, but they have a chief executive. So I presume that means he's salaried. He says that our move away from Christianity, the CPS has said that Christianity doesn't fit with modern times. That's the Crown Prosecution Service has said. Bear, bear in mind, they're all about balance with the blindfold on at our courts of justice. They're saying that Christianity doesn't reflect modern times. That's basically another way of saying that diversity, inclusivity and equality, which is the ac acronym for DIE, if you hadn't already, if you didn't already know that. That's another way of saying, actually, it's not very inclusive to be religious, is it? But they don't go after Islam. They don't go after Hinduism. They don't go after Orthodox. No, they go after Christianity. So we need to look at that, don't we? Because they wouldn't dare go there, would they? Why not? So we need to look at that. So here's a quote from him. Um, it's been a massive wake up call, which prompts fresh reconsiderations of the role of religion in society. He refers to us as being a uh, non-religious population, which is not true. The law has failed to keep up with the pace of, of uh, change, resulting in enormous non-religious population in England and Wales facing everyday discrimination. Who's being discriminated against? 
what? Family, faith and freedom. Who's being attacked because of Christianity? It's nonsense. It's a lie. From getting local school places to, to receiving appropriate emotional support in hospitals. You see, now this is the sort of infection, guys. This is the sort of disease. Now, nothing like Molotov cocktails being thrown at you. Of course, that's terrorism as far as I'm concerned. That's a new world. That, that you know, Someone's going to die. That's a new world. That's a completely different ballpark. But this insidious, evil infection, this disease. And now that's just one CE of an organization. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how many people that they employ or how big they are. But I presume if the independent are quoting them, they might be quite big. I'm not sure. Now, where's the, where's the, where's the Church of England on this? Where's Justin Welby on these comments? Where's he? Nowhere to be seen. Nothing. Not a word. Nothing at all. So, yes, Daphne, we can, of course, talk more about uh, global reach, European reach, start small, little acorns. But it's very important that, again, if, if I've done nothing but bang the drum on this one point, conservatives have fallen asleep on the job. Globalist politicians, globalist self-interested corrupt MPs. I, 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 I'm so ang betrayed, betrayed by the Conservative Party forever irreparably and i'm not the only one that feels like that it needs to die we know that so what's left what's left is conservatives and conservatism but my goodness are we behind they're not weaponized they're not mobilized they're running for their lives they're terrified because of diversity inclusivity and equality so just lately just lately i was asked to leave campus so uh, 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 the trans woman that i mentioned i a man they were saying it's really simple say her pronouns and I told them, I won't, I won't repeat what I said because we're live and we have an audience, but I told them what to do. And I said, over my dead body, am I saying that? I'm not saying it. I'm not going to attack you. I'm not going to hurt you. No one does that. Live your life. You're over 18. You clearly need help. You're over 18. Go and live your life. But I'm not using your pronouns because I'm not enabling this evil. Now, in certain parts of the world, Scotland, I believe, and as, you, as, you've, as you've alluded to in Greece, you might get hurt. In Portland, in America, that's now a militia. In Portland, in the US, that's now a militia, guys. You could get really badly hurt. So yes, we, hmm. we, know, that we know that our way of life, as we know it, with regards to freedom of speech, um, free market economics, and traditional family values, you can break conservatism down into all these different areas. But it's the backbone of our species. It's the backbone of our nation. We have to mobilize. We have to spread the word. We have to inspire and motivate. It's all that matters. No stats, no words. We must inspire and motivate because I'm on campus weekly and these kids are running scared. They're terrified because of what will happen. Our universities have these things called Dean of Inclusion, Dean of Equality. They actually have Deans of Inclusion. And guess what? They're massive commies, massive socialists. So we're talking about infected we're talking about diseased institutions where our bread and butter, our grassroots, our conservative brothers and sisters are running scared when it's, it's the natural order of our species and we're running scared. We didn't start the culture war, but we will finish it. But we can't do it single handedly. Everybody's going to have to do something and play their part. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Daphne said that. before that, uh, so, sorry for interrupting, um, that maybe it's in the nature of the conservatives that they don't react so easily and they don't get mobilized. Um, do you think that, uh, would you say that uh, they are not aware of the crit criticality of the situation and they don't realize that we are at war, for instance? Sure. Because, uh, and what what will be the thing? I, I'm afraid a little bit that if you if you try to radicalize the things, then this would scare them more. Yes. And uh, yes. some people see uh, activism as a radical reaction, even if it is in the form that you do it. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes they identify activism as a leftist, uh, act a left, left, leftist, leftist action. action. They're not used to that. And um, I'm afraid that even if somebody, I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want to make you feel bad about it. But I, I'm just yeah, afraid sure. that if somebody, if somebody tries more to convince them, uh, especially in ways like that, okay, I see it from the perspective of a Greek. Okay, I have always in mind how it how it is in a Greek university. Although I studied in German and it was absolutely different. Um, uh, but but. I'm just afraid that um, conservatives 
in in our country, uh, for, for instance, there was a research where uh, even left people people that vote for for the left have uh, conservative values sometimes in a rate of eighty percent, and uh, this is also weird. Uh, however, um, I'm I'm just afraid that people don't want um, uh, to lose their uh, let's say. Um, um, Easiness. I mean, uh, the, the the routine okay. that they have because they care about their family, they care about their jobs and everything, which is not something negative, of course. Mm. And it's just they don't get the message that we are on war. That's yeah. that's that's the critical point for me. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, what can I possibly say to that? Because on the one hand, I don't want to, I don't want to um, decimate and completely destroy all young conservatives. I also don't want to decimate and destroy all conservative backbenchers who are doing their best with the Conservative Party. I also don't want to say that parties like Reform don't have a chance. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you're once again, you've absolutely nailed it. And I'm in an impossible position. So instead of what I, I will lead by example, I despise political correctness. So I will lead by example. The most important word here is radical. Now, of course, no one. I, I don't want any harm to come to anybody in this process. It's very important. We defend ourselves. And of course, if it's if it's self-defense, that's absolutely fine. But the reality is that we're not radical enough. So activism, being a lefty or a commie, it's in the playbook. It's in the books. It's in the culture. They like getting their hands dirty. The stuff that I've seen is really timid. It's really tame. Um, maybe they're waiting to make their move. They will be met with resistance if they do that, however. So I don't really know what's going to happen. But it's, we're not radical enough. We're, we're, too, we're, we're terrified of our own shadows. We're politically correct. We wait in line. And I, and I wanted to mention something with regards to your point. This is really important. Um, I forget exactly what you said. But I said, I was speaking with an MP. And it's been this in the last couple of months. And I said, why don't I mention this in my previous point a second ago. I said, why aren't we talking about this in Westminster, about woke culture and about far left Marxism? Everybody loves to use the word far right. They love to use far right, far right Nazi and neo-fascist or, or fascist. They, they love to do that. Why aren't we talking about the far left? You know, why aren't we talking about the far left? And, and he said to me, he said, look, and again, he gave me such a beautiful answer. He said, look, that's a US problem. And it probably isn't, you know, we don't, we don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill. Very British. Perfect answer. Again, so politically correct, so clever. Even Thatcher, she was being interviewed by Thro Frost in the 80s, and he, and he said, are you right wing? And, of course, she was a poet. She was, she was eloquent. And she, she, it's all there on YouTube. She swerved the question. She said, what is right wing? She's beautiful with what she said. That time is over. That period has passed. We are in a war. It's not cinematic. It's not on the battlefield. There is no victor at the end. We're talking about something satanic. We're talking about something insidious by people who have no values, who have no morals, who have no ethics. We're talking about that as well as the far left Marxism madness as well. So we're not radical enough. Conservatives like money. Conservatives like doing really well for themselves. Conservatives like being left on their own. Conservatives don't like getting their hands dirty. And I, I, I don't know what else I can say apart from... We're, we are in such a dire straits. We're in such a bad position that all that's left to do is to call out fake conservatives and to call out liberals. That's all that's left now. Because, you know, your point, can we convert them or will we scare them off? Well, I don't want to waste my time finding out. If, if a man doesn't know his duty and he's not God-fearing, then I don't know what to say. I'm not going to waste my time with it. So what percentage does that leave across Europe, in the UK and across the world? What percentage does that leave? Does it does it drop from like 30 percent down to 10? Well, that's still a load of people. So the reality is, is that political apathy plays a big part here, guys. It plays a big part. People are tired. This is what pandemic and COVID did to people. This is what lockdown did to people. People are tired. They're angry. They're upset. In life, we have light and we have darkness. And people are moving more towards the darkness every single day. This is the godlessness that I'm referring to. Okay, and we can see that in our society. Nick. So, 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 do you think that um, the the elites, um, you know, um, are um, because you know the elites? When when we talk about the elites, we 
we talk about political elites, we talk about um, economic elites. So it seems as though um, there is a whole structure of people, uh, I would say that they think that they are um, citizens of the world and not citizens of the UK, citizens of Greece, citizens yeah. of Italy, mm. etc. So, do you think uh, that we are fighting against um, forces that are now uh, international? I, I don't mean it, you know, uh, with um, with a conspiracy behind it, but you know, you know, we see what happens in Davos. We 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 we've read. Uh, what the Great Reset uh, is, and we, we, we find out with climate change uh, being used uh, as a playbook um, of passing um, policies in every nation um, that are ambiguous, at least, to say. Um, and we've seen that um, through this playbook, um, a new world order um, is um, is trying. They are trying to to establish new world order. So, so do you think this is a reality? This is an enemy that we are fighting, or do you think it is just a conspiracy theory? So, I think first of all, in terms of the in terms of the goodness and the the the, the production and positivity of our of our of our chat tonight, it wouldn't be appropriate to not mention globalism. It wouldn't be appropriate to not mention the global elite, new world order, and being surrounded by demonic forces. It wouldn't be appropriate to not mention that. So presuming we're wrapping up soon, and based on what you've just said, Raphael, I will happily contribute here because it happens to be a little passion of mine. And if liberals and lefties, because remember, we need to deconstruct their little agenda because it's very transparent, Imagine if you don't just call him a Nazi, but you call him a conspiracy theorist as well. Oh, double whammy. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So just recently, I'm on campus once again, and I'm with a socialist, and he can't hold his own, and economically I destroyed him. But then he decided to move on to COVID and to a pandemic and to lockdown and all this other stuff and feelings over facts and, and, um, and uh, den denial about globalism and all sorts of other things, which, by the way, the left now call denialism. They've invented a word called denialism. So if you don't agree with them... The tolerant left, if you don't agree with them, you're in denialism. So that's fantastic. So are we, are, can we win? I, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you guys. I've been honest the whole time. And uh, political correctness, we need to lead from the front. Can we win against globalism? No, we can't. Can we win the culture war? Yeah, potentially. But you can't win against globalism. You can't because the people that pull the strings at the top, they are, it, the, the, the power is too overwhelming. The only thing that's left, is a is a is a right wing conservative national leader the likes of Maloney for example the only the only way around this is if all of those key European countries have at the exact same time the same sort of caliber courage God fearing strength and who believe in this in the sovereign nation state so they, that would have to be mobilized and of course in terms of when elections happen it's very difficult to do that so can you win against the global elite no can you win against globalism no but as 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 Christians or as as, as God fearing men and women, we're we're more interested in the afterlife than we are this life. So, well, Nick, there is Elon Musk, who I don't think is you know a person that uh, that belongs in the in the globalistic uh, establishment. Yes, but he wouldn't be Elon Musk if there wouldn't be globalization. You know. All right, I agree with you. Yes, correct. But you know, uh, there is always hope. That the richest man in the world is not with on their side. I don't know if you, if uh, you know you if you agree with this point. It's possible, guys. Look, what, what I've been saying for a very long time is I, I don't I don't mind saying it. It sounds really cheesy, but what we need is a hero. I've been saying it for a very <laughs> long time. I know it sounds corny, but we do. We need a hero. So like I I can fly my flag. And I can go and fight at a street level and I can I can rally the troops and I can talk about the good word of conservatism. But something big has to happen, whether it's Trump or Musk or DeSantis or it, it doesn't matter. 
something big has to happen to do with this conservative pledge that we've launched or conservative allegiance, but something big has to happen. We've got too many egos in politics. If I had a pound for every time I've heard this and then I've looked at the person whose ego is bigger than the size of the room, I'm thinking, yeah, you're part of the problem. Yeah, you're really interested in your following, aren't you? What do you actually do about this? You just talk. So I'm sorry, but you're getting called out. And if that upsets you or I don't get on your channel, then I don't care because I because my soul's intact. My heart's intact. So listen, the Musks, the Trumps, the DeSantis, that we, we, so, we need a hero. Someone must step forward and say, I, I, listen, I respect the state sovereignty, the borders, the faith, family, freedom. And based on that, globalism can't win. So globalism cannot win if you have those things. If you have God fearing men and women who are willing to die for their cause and who believe in borders and state sovereignty, then yes, through economics, it might be possible, but it's not a conspiracy theory. The WEF is not a conspiracy theory. New World Order, fourth stage of the Industrial Revolution is not a conspiracy theory. They've written the books. It's all there in black and white. What can't speak can't lie. It's all there. It's 100% coming from above. Once you dismantle the nuclear family, dismantle religion, dismantle free speech, dismantle borders, there are a few things that unite us and hold us together as a sovereign nation state, including the flag. Once you make the flag racist, once you decolonize and teach critical race theory and Black Lives Matter, once you teach people to hate their brothers and sisters, which is the opposite of what the Bible teaches us with love thy neighbor. Once you've gone to the deepest, darkest, hedonistic, um, godlessness part of the human soul and, and hedonism and depravity and men can become women and women can become men. Once you've done that, you can't undo that. Remember, this is an insidious agenda. Once you've done that, you can't undo it. You, you might be able to fight back, but we've spoken about that in the culture war. So the only thing that's left is the conservatism is the last stand. So we've got wokeness, we've got diversity, inclusivity, equality, and we've got demonic forces. Hundred percent, I believe that. What, what the, the last stand is conservatism, which is conservatism, which is a right wing philosophy, it's a right wing ideology. Culturally, it means X Y Z, and economically, it means X Y Z. No more political correctness. We need a hero at the helm, but we need collaboration and we need a conglomerate. We need we need to be mobilized in the same way that the left have become. Because yes, the media, yes, corporations, yes, institutions, but it's safety in numbers, it's power to the people. Ironically, you know, we, we're, we, uh, you know if, you, if you love your country and if you're a patriot, you don't want to interfere in other parts of the world. You want to look up, actually, it's very community-based, isn't it, conservatism, which again has been completely bastardized by the left. So it's not over, there is still hope, but as long as we have our infected governments, our WEF puppets, the Rishi Sunaks of the world, for example, as long as they're at the helm, as long as they're in charge, then it's a one-way ticket, guys, unfortunately. We can do the best we can. We can fight back. We can die with honour, you know, when, when that time comes. We can, we can die with honour, but we can't change it. So what we need is whoever's inside the tent or close enough to it, we need radical reform. We need radical change. And they're going to have to be willing to, um, to give, to, to, they're going to have to be willing to give absolutely everything for the cause. So dark times speaking so that speaking that's something that's uh, Panayotis, because we've exceeded our time short I think. question short question all right one last okay. short question because i think Panayotis. it's something we wanted to ask from the beginning of the to... speaking of something very big i agree with you uh we need something very big with a leader and an inspiration also for other countries to react um if you if you would ask me to name Two big, two big, the two biggest things in the last 10 years. One was Trump, the other one was the bre Brexit. First of all, Brexit. How come, uh, even though it was something so big, that firstly, uh, no big leader uh, was born through this uh, procedure um, to inspire the people? and fight against um, all this system, the global system that was against the Brexit. Uh, that's the first question. And additionally is that, do you think that the Brexit uh, that actually broke apart the nation um, uh, mobilized people uh, under your cause, our cause? Um... In terms of the first question, I, I don't know the answer. I just know that it keeps me awake at night because I don't understand how it's even remotely possible that someone hasn't emerged. You know, I can I can put my name forward so many times, but I'm not an MP yet. So, I, I mean, listen, it, it is <laughs> I, I can only there's 24 hours in a day and I work 25 of them. So there's only so much I can do. But to, to your that's a really important question. Where is our leader? Where is our savior? Well, well, 
in a duty religious context, we know that. But in terms of the political, and it is very important that we discuss this, why have they not risen? Where, where, where are they? What, you know, you got in Italy, Maloney, you got Orban in Hungary. And some people, you, Trump, in, Trump in the US said some silly things that I don't know why he said that. You know, I, as, a, as, a, as a devout Christian conservative, I don't know why he said that, but he did. But it doesn't matter because, you know, you're talking about real big responsibility. So, it, it, you know, you, you take a stand. That's the whole that's the whole argument. You take a stand. So why is this not happening in the UK? Is it because we're lazy? Is it because we're politically apathetic? Is it because we don't care? How do we explain this phenomenon that you've got this great country with all these possibilities and no one has risen? We don't have a right wing government. We don't have a right wing party, guys. What well, we don't have it. So, for example, you know, if I question Farage and I say like things like, you know, what happened to UKIP? Where's UKIP gone? How where's the Brexit party gone? And I speak to his associates and no one really gives me an answer. They might talk about it a little bit. but I don't really get an answer. I don't really understand it. I don't I need it. I need it broken down as though I was a three year old because I don't understand it. So which links into your second point. My answer to the first question is I don't know. But the, the second question is is if I if I heard you right is has Brexit mobilized us? Is it a catalyst for something new? Listen, unification is all that matters, and you know divide and conquer is War One Hundred One. So obviously, I don't want to be divided with my brothers and sisters. But the reality is, is that I I will always hold David Cameron to account. He he, it's good that he called it, but we, Brexit isn't complete yet. We're still in the ECHR. We've still got small boats arriving. We're still dictated to by Brussels in so many respects. So, yeah, it happened. It's not been finalised or finished. And he did it at a time that he knew it would completely divide us. Well, David Cameron's about as liberal as it gets. He's not a conservative. He's as liberal as it gets. So did he do it strategically? Did he do it strategically in, in answering your question? So I'm not saying I'd want him to take it back. We needed the vote. The vote went in. We're pro-democracy on the right. The left hate democracy, hence why they cry like babies about it. I don't I don't know is the answer to that second question. We're, well, the, the Brexit. Well, the thing is, is that we're not we're not mobilized because we're just so angry that we haven't got the result. So we're 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 we're, we're delirious with rage that we haven't got the result we wanted to. And there were these ridiculous terms like hard Brexit and soft Brexit. Brexit means Brexit. We're out and we will trade around the world. And this fear mongering that we have to be tied to Brussels apron strings, that we can't be a profiting a surviving, thriving country unless we're part of Brussels. Absolutely nonsense. And we would see other European countries follow suit. So has it united us? Yeah. But we're dealing with a corrupt government that hasn't delivered. So it's united us. But it's also just you're talking about a very angry workforce. You're talking about a very upset populace because it hasn't been delivered on. So, again, it's just very dark, isn't it? When I'm put when I have to actually deliver on an answer. It's very dark, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, well, I think uh, you know. Uh, of course, I'm not um, living in the UK, but uh, what I observed from the Brexit vote was that the multicultural London um, that um, of the big corporations and people living one upon the other uh, did vote for Brexit and. You know, uh, all the periphery, all the, the people out, not all of them, but many people outside London where they have, you know, established uh, a lot of them a new life leaving London or already being uh, outside. Uh, you know, they are closer to conservative values because they're living a life where it is not so fast, they're living a life um, where they can ease, more easier uh, make families. Uh, maybe they are safer outside London because of, of the crime rates in London. The same thing applies, but in the, not, not such a big scale in, uh, in Athens compared to uh, other uh, peripheral cities uh, that are not the capital. So uh, if I can contribute uh, a little bit in, in this conversation is that uh, big cities that accumulate the wealth and um, many, many people of different origins and different cultures uh, are, um, you know, uh, they are 
something like uh, the beginning of a new era. And if I think the conservative movement can contribute is that to something is that life in the periphery is a more is it is closer to the quality and what we preach. So I think that um, that should be um, you know a, a cultural paradigm uh, for conservatives um, to 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 say to 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 show the comparative advantage advantage of a conservative life. So it is something that the conservative movement hasn't done so much. I think that's my 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 opinion. On that I don't know if you. Well, before before we go to before we go to any final questions, which I'd happily happily take. You're absolutely right. So I can confirm. I know a bit about Athens. But London's a liberal woke hellhole. It's the London metropolitan elite run by a mafia called the Conservative Party. And, and my, I, I grew up there. I, I worked there. I worked in Mayfair. I worked in the city. I know it very, very well. I live I, I, hugely well, hugely well. I don't want to go there anymore. And of course, anyone watching this who's a lefty is like, good, don't come. Well, I'm still going to come and upset you. So, no. <laughs> but but it's, it's awful. So again, let's look at the agenda. Let's unpack the agenda. Why is it we're seeing a pattern here with certain cities? Why are we seeing that? And New Portland in Oregon in the US, you, you can use it anywhere. I'm not in, I'm not edified with regards to all cities. I'm not regard Berlin, Oslo. I don't I don't know. Um, but let's look at Budapest. But let's look at that. So London is somewhere you do not want to go. It's an awful place. Propaganda everywhere. Anti-conservative, hedonistic hellhole. Awful place. Knife crime through the roof. Very dangerous place. And you can go to the nightclubs. There's now security there because of knife crime. The stark change between what the grassroots should be doing, having fun, being tolerant of each other and all that good stuff. Compare that with 15 years ago, not 100 years ago, not 50 years ago, not 20 years ago, 5, 10 years ago. It's a horrible, nasty place. So, yeah, to your point, yes, that is real. And we should look at why. Is it because it's funded? Is it because it's deliberate? Is it, you know, is it because it's a little mafia now around Westminster or around where government and where politics happens, fake conservatives, etc.? But, I, but again, with every point that gets made here where we're just talking about it, I want to reinforce the point that regardless of how good the question is that I'm asked, whether we can defeat globalism, whether we can win the culture war, why is this happening? Why is that happening? All that matters is that we all get up, stand and fight now. That's it. I don't have answers. I don't proclaim to have answers. What matters is that we stand up and fight. Safety in numbers, guys. All right. Uh, yeah, I think Daphne wants to make a question. All right, Daphne, this is the final final question. Of course, she has the right is... for the last question. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. So it's been really engaging regarding the the opportunity and the possibility of winning. All I have to say is that we are fighters. We're not uh, we're not giving the battle for the winning. We're giving the battle because of the duty and it's the honor. That's why we're here. That's why we want to motivate people. And yes. We do believe that we can win, regardless of this possibility. If, if they were in this possibility, we wouldn't have the courage to go on. And what I would have to say towards, you know, the possibility of winning is as simple as that. We strategize. We will adapt to the changes. We will adapt to the battlefield. The political battlefield that is constantly changing, and we will do it in the most effective way. We will use political we will use everyone we can in order to to make it possible. And when it comes to political politicians who are economic right and not cultural right, at least we can expect of them that they will cut the funding to universities, to professors, to uh, to everyone who is who is working with this work propaganda that they are funding in our universities and critical courses and academics really uh, brainwashing the the young students and you know and uh, courses and syllabus that you know lead you to to nowhere when it comes to the modern financial world, you have you have like you have a degree with no skills. You can do nothing rather than you know being brainwashed uh, in yeah. this society. So yes, I mean maybe they're not on our side, hundred percent. But in our strategy, we can always use them. We can use the potential. We can at least try to convince them that okay, you're financially right wing. Prove it. Do not waste our taxes in those in funding those uh those kinds of, uh, of of things at least that's mm. the least we can expect so yeah, in our yeah. strategy yes we might not have 100 percent people that are fully aligned with us but at least we have to know what to expect from anyone use them strategize and yes guys i'm, I'm sure we can win 
if we do it because we're brave, we are bold, and we're fighters. Thank yeah, you. Let, just re re remember, guys, last, last last point here. The left started the fight. Yeah, the left started the fight, but the new right will finish it. All right. Great. Uh, it was uh, it was a pleasure. It was uh, a great great talk uh, with uh, Nick Tanconi, CEO of Turning Point UK. Uh, do do you have you met uh, Charlie Kirk, Candace Owens of uh, Turning Point US, Nick? No, so I'm due to go. So in terms of when I joined the firm, I, there was a lot of work that I had to do. I really had to earn it, and I feel like I have. So the US trip, I've been with the firm for. 14 months just over a year the the us trip is it's actually booked it's actually booked today it's largely irrelevant but it's actually booked today so i will be going over in december just before christmas to make my debut with uh the us and hopefully i'll get some time to talk hopefully hopefully we'll get some time to talk i mean obviously there'll be meeting and greeting of course and we stay close throughout the year but um i'm really hoping that it could be a bit more than that because we, we try and go over once a year give or take but timing wise, I just had to, um, I had to, I had a lot to do first and, and you've got to earn these things as well. So I haven't met those people yet. Charlie Kirk, as you know, is the founder of Turning Point and Candice plays a big, um, an important part uh, as a political commentator in that field. And I'm very excited to meet our US brothers and sisters who are of the same conservative belief system, not none of this fake liberal, fake conservative, you know, nonsense. Um, I've not met them, but, but hopefully soon. All right, we, we hopefully uh, will meet you uh, soon in person. I we, we, we will be more than uh, happy to have you here in Greece. You can stay at anyone's home. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think we will uh, have the opportunity to discuss again. Thank you very and much, Nick. Repeat this. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Λοιπόν, Νίκ Τενκόνη, πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα συζήτηση πιστεύω σήμερα. Ε, είδαμε ε, εν της πράγμαση ποια είναι τα κοινά ε, τα οποία μας συνδέουν. Ε, φυσικά τα εθνικά συμφέροντα της Βρετανία, τα εθνικά συμφέροντα της Ελλάδος, τα εθνικά συμφέροντα της Αμερικής είναι διαφορετικά, της Ουγγαρίας και τα λοιπά, μην αναφέρουμε τώρα όλες τις χώρες. Όμως, αυτό που μας ενώνει όλους είναι η κοινή συμφωνία ότι ο πολιτισμός μας, ο δυτικός πολιτισμός, ο ελληνικός, ο ρωμαϊκός, ο χριστιανικός πολιτισμός είναι ένα ενιαίο όλων, το οποίο δέχεται συντονισμένη επίθεση από τις ελίτ, από συγκεκριμένα κέντρα του ελίτ, από ένα μέρος της αριστεράς, από ένα μέρος των, της τύπης κεντροδεξιάς και σε αυτό το πόλεμο υπάρχουν άνθρωποι, τον πολιτισμικό πόλεμο φυσικά, υπάρχουν άνθρωποι οι οποίοι έχουν τις ίδιες, ασπάζονται τις ίδιες ιδέες με μας, ε, όπως ε, είδαμε, δηλαδή φαντάζομαι ότι πολλοί από εσάς που παρακολουθήσατε ε, συμφωνούσατε κατά ένα 80% έστω με αυτά τα οποία έλεγε ο προσκεκλημένος μας. Ε, άρα αυτό σημαίνει ότι υπάρχει μια ε, συνείδηση μία αυτοσυνειδησία ότι ε, μπορούμε να συνεργαστούμε ούτως ώστε να μην είμαστε μόνοι μας σε αυτό τον πραγματικά πολύ δύσκολο αγώνα ε, απέναντι στο το έθεσε godlessness απέναντι σε αυτή την αθεία, εμένα μου άρεσε αυτό ε, αρκεί να υπάρχουν άνθρωποι ε, οι οποίοι πάλι όπως το έθεσε ο Τενκόνη οι οποίοι να έχουν την τιμή honor όπως το είπε ε, και την, την αίσθηση του καθήκοντος να προχωρήσουν σε αυτόν τον αγώνα. Λοιπόν, ε, επομένως νομίζω ότι ήταν χρήσιμη υπό αυτή την έννοια ε, η συζήτηση αυτή για να αντιληφθούμε τα πράγματα τα οποία μας ενώνουν και όχι θα μας χωρίζουν. Ε, τέλος, αυτό που ήθελα να πω είναι ότι για την Ελλάδα αυτό που συμβαίνει με το ριζοσπαστικό Ισλάμ ε, και σε συνδυασμό με τα συντηρητικά κινήματα στην Ευρώπη, είναι ένα πάρα πολύ καλό επιχείρημα, ούτως ώστε να χρησιμοποιηθεί εναντίον της Τουρκίας και της πρακτικής της, η οποία εγκολπώνει, αλλά και προωθεί προς την Ευρώπη το ριζοσπαστικό Ισλάμ. Άρα, υπό αυτή την έννοια, ο συντηρητισμός αυτή τη στιγμή ως ενιαίο δυτικό κίνημα 
ευνοεί κατά τη δική μας, τη δική μου τέλο πάντων, εκτίμηση γεωπολιτικά την Ελλάδα, αρκεί να το χρησιμοποιήσει σωστά και όχι οι πρωθυπουργοί αυτής της χώρας να βγαίνουν και να μιλάνε για δεξιούς Ορμπάν και αριστερούς Ορμπάν, δεξιούς Τραμπ και αριστερούς Τραμπ. Διότι δεν έχουν καμία συνείδηση το τι σημαίνει ε, ο αγώνας και πώς εξυπηρετούνται ιδεολογικά τουλάχιστον τα γεωπολιτικά συμφέροντα της χώρας. Θα να ευχαριστήσω ξανά τη Δάφνη Νούση, η οποία ε, ήταν ο, ο, ο κύριος συντελεστής και ο κύριος καταλήτης που τους ώστε να ε, λάβει χώρα αυτή η συζήτηση με το Turning Point UK. Τον Παναγιώτη, όπως πάντα. Μην ξεχάσετε να εγγραφείτε στο κανάλι μας Right to the Bone και ραντεβού αύριο. Καλό βράδυ. Καλό σας βράδυ. Καληνύχτα. Shut up and sit down. You wanted law and order in this town. You've got it. People are ready to tell us this is not possible. That is not possible. I say whatever the true interest of our country calls for is always possible. He had a press conference the other day that he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic party of the community. He wanted the commission to be the executive and he wanted the council of ministers to be the senate. No, no, no. You know, they have a word. It sort of became old-fashioned. It's called a nationalist. And I say, really, we're not supposed to use that word. You know what I am? I'm a nationalist, okay? I'm a nationalist. You know, when I came here 17 years ago, and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? You wanted law and order in this town. You've got it. Thank <laughs> you.